Let's pray. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. We've heard the scriptures read, and now we hear them interpreted. May we hear what you are saying to the church today, and may we find the courage to follow your will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text this week is a perfect example of why I like to preach straight through a biblical book, even though it can take a while. It's far more common at this point to preach short series of four to six weeks on a certain theme or to follow the lectionary, which is a system of readings that takes about three years to get through but doesn't cover anywhere near the entire Bible. If we stick to either of those methods, we get to skip the passages that give ministers heartburn, the kind of passages that keep you awake at night if you're trying to figure out what to do with them, and the kind of passages the average Bible reader skims, reads very quickly, and tries to move forward to get to a more comfortable part. In our text this morning, Jesus has some pretty harsh words to say, and he even seems to be getting fed up of having to say them. He basically says, why do I talk at all? At first glance, I would say that this doesn't put the best face on our beloved Savior. There's a duality embedded in this passage that we are profoundly uncomfortable with. The notion that there are different places and everybody is going to one of two makes us squirm today. Easier to pass it along and don't put it in the lectionary. Long gone are the days, I believe when many people might have said boldly amen to this kind of thing, being sure that they were on the good or the right holy side. Not only are we not so sure we're on the right side, we're actually uncomfortable with the concept of sides at all, and certainly that there are people on the wrong side. So we'll get into this and try to understand what God is saying to his church. It's a great little passage. Verse 21 is the attention grabber. This is the blaring headline that makes you double click on it. He said to them, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. That's pretty final. Now, two things jump out to me from this. First, it's very clear. Jesus is arguing here that there are two paths. There are two ways to go. Everybody's going somewhere. And even if some people seek him, they're still not going to find him. So by definition, even those people who are seeking him are actually on the wrong path and are going to continue to be. This is a downer. We're very uncomfortable with the idea of two paths. We prefer to say that's your truth, you use your truth, and I'll go my way with my truth, and we'll agree to disagree. And yet we know that there are boundaries. There are lines we will not allow other people to cross with us that we do not think are appropriate. We don't agree on where the lines are, but here's what we're actually doing. We all stay far enough away from the lines that where the lines are don't really matter to our day-to-day because we don't press up against them. And what happens is every single time we press up against them, we get confused, we get angry, we get frustrated, and we don't know what to do or what to think or what to believe. And I'm going to give you just one recent example of this, and hopefully you'll be able to put other ones in your minds. When you look at images of Afghanistan today and women in burqas, we can probably all agree in North America it is a bad and terrible thing if women are forced to wear a burqa. But what do we believe or think of women who actually could choose to wear one? Maybe we can't even conceive of a woman choosing to wear one. And yet we hear that it happens. When we press up against an idea like, should women wear burqas, should that be a thing, we're entering a level where there are lines. And we prefer to say we're multi-faith, multicultural, open to diversity, and we don't want to go there. As long as we don't get too close to that line, it's easy to say that. Jesus, in our passage, is laying down a truth, a line. There are two paths. One goes this way. One goes that way. One is the presence of the Father towards the presence of the divine that which you're made for. The other is a furthering of a cursedness, a brokenness, a sinfulness, going further away and swirling. 
Now, please understand me. I'm not trying to talk about Muslim sisters and whether they should wear burqas. The point is how uncomfortable we get when we start to say there's a right way and a wrong way. And here stands Jesus saying, hey, folks, there's a right way and a wrong way. Now, the other element in this that jumps out to you, or at least to me, is that people who think they know where they are going, who are sure that they are on the right path, might actually be on the wrong one. There's a little debate about this passage as far as who is Jesus talking to here? Is he talking to the religious elite, the Pharisees and scribes? Because earlier in John, that's who he's dialoguing with. Or is he simply talking to the more general Jewish people in front of him? I think either way, he's talking to people who consider themselves the people of God, who consider themselves to be on the right path, to be particularly chosen. The people who say, God the Father is on our side. And what Jesus does here, it's like if he showed up to our church here and started railing about every form of hypocrisy he could find in Westminster and pointing out sins amongst the people and then say, it doesn't matter how often you come to church, how many Bible studies you attend, how many committee meetings you do, how many hymns you sing, how many prayers you say, you can't follow me, you're sinners, and you're not going to get there. That would rub us as harsh, wouldn't it? And yet it's true, none of that stuff earns us anything. Trusting it leads us nowhere. No matter how many meetings I go to, I am not more holy for them. Jesus is saying, you're all headed somewhere where you're going. He quotes the Old Testament prophet at one point saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And that's it. There's a witness to that at Christian funerals. It's amazing to see one of the many of the best funerals I've attended come at the end of a life that's been empowered by the beliefs of a person, their particular compassion, their particular ability to love becomes noteworthy, a legacy of love, of love in action, not just in words. I've had the privilege of presiding over many funerals where you get to ask a question like, If you're in this room today, what did that person's faith have to do with how they related to you? Do you notice anything? We all know this to be true. Famous preachers know this to be true. Everybody knows your actions speak louder than your words. The times that you hold someone's hand, the times you answer a phone call, little kindnesses in moments that are as unglamorous as can be, and you might even think are unimportant. Those are what a preacher is remembered by, and it is what each of us are remembered by, the little actions. You very rarely hear somebody at a funeral say, I remember when so-and-so taught me about this. Instead, they remember when they brought you soup. So anyway, the passage starts with a bang that there are two ways to go about life, and it matters which one you do. The actions of the religious folks and the Pharisees in the days of Jesus are speaking louder than their teachings, are speaking louder than their rulings, and Jesus is trying to point them away from that posture and towards a posture of action. You might remember at one point, John the Baptist was gaining momentum, and he sends his students to go find Jesus and say, are you the one we're looking for? And then Jesus doesn't say, okay, sit down and take notes. I'm going to explain it to you. He says, take a look around, see what's happening. Go look and report on what you see. Not listen, take notes and learn, but watch and see. So what he says is, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. When you watch and see, you don't see me. And then when you go and act, you do so poorly. One commentator describes the next thing here. This is shot across the bow. The Jews will ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, I will go where you cannot come? So the commentator says, what a wicked and sarcastic jibe. The Jews believe that suicide caused a person to occupy the worst place in hell. Josephus, one of the first historians, the Jewish historian, he says, the souls of those whose hands have done violence to their own lives go to the darkest Hades and God the Father will visit the sins of the evildoers on their descendants. In essence, they were saying, he says we can't follow him. He must be going to hell then. And he's right. We can't follow him there. 
With scorn, they responded to the Lord, and in so doing, they confirmed his words. You see how that works? They're like, oh, yeah, because you're going to the wrong spot, and we're all going to the right spot. That's what's happening here. We get confused, right? I want to have sympathy for these people, though, because I am a sinner just like them, and I don't think I would respond that well to this sermon being laid out at me. I know we head down a path. And it can feel like we can't turn around. You set out, you think you know where you're going, you're doing the right thing. It turns out maybe you don't, you're getting a little more hesitant, you're not so sure. But you can't turn around, you're too invested. One time we were out skiing, Mary and I, I might have told you this before, it's, it's a ridiculous story. We had two friends and they had never cross country skied before. And we went on this path and we were wearing like Lycra stuff because we were gonna do this little five kilometer loop. <laughs> and so we go out, we're taking photos and it's all fun and games, everybody's happy. And as we're going, it occurs to me relatively quickly, we have certainly gone beyond five kilometers and we haven't looped back and I have no idea where we are. And so I'm trying to pretend like it's okay and we're going to find our way back and not let these guys get spooked. And as we go, they're getting more and more and more tired. It starts to get dark out. And so now we're starting to panic, right? Like we are way down the path. Turning around is completely not an option because if we turn around, like it would take us hours and hours to get home. Like we're really, truly, totally lost. And other skiing, there's, there's an old rowboat. And I looked at this little metal rowboat and I thought, maybe we could sleep under that and like get through the night. And I thought, this is getting, this is getting bad when I'm thinking that. Like we're, we're in spandex, we have no clothes, we have no food, we, like we're in trouble. Eventually there's a light off in the distance and Mary says, maybe we should go to that light. And I'm a male, right? So I'm like, no, what do we need the light for? She's like, no, no, let's go to the light. And so we went to the light and there was a guy there uh, and he, he drove us back to our car. And he said, actually, it was funny because the sign at the start of the, the, the track is no good. And so he does this like super regularly and he has a dog that barks and it tells him when there's people out there at night because so many people wander out near where this guy lives. Point being that you, you hit it, a point of your investment. You've gone so far down the road. There's like no way to turn back. And that's kind of what's happening here. You got these Pharisees, you got Jewish people, you got scribes. They've gone down the road. This is what they believe. This is how their beliefs are lived out, these festivals and these ways of mercy and compassion that they do have. This is what it looks like. The challenge is that while for, how, for us, there are times when turning around is a bad idea. Like if you're lost in the woods, if you stay still, you're a lot easier to find, right? We all know this, like stop moving at the very least. In the life of faith, you can always turn around and find a new path. And so Jesus is opening up to them. They're saying, you're going down the wrong path, but don't worry. You're able to turn and take a different path. The word repentance, metanoia in the Greek actually just means turn around. That's it. Before they've gone too far down the path, Jesus has told them they can't go where he's going if they keep it up. And then he explains the problem to them, which is actually really helpful. And Eugene Peterson's uh, paraphrase of the Bible is particularly helpful, the message. He writes it this way. Jesus said, you are tied down to the mundane. I'm in touch with what is beyond your horizons. You live in terms of what you see and touch. I'm living on other terms. I told you that you're missing God in all of this. You're at the dead end. If you won't believe I am who I say I am, you're at the dead end of sins. You're missing God in your lives. To be of this world or of another one. Two paths. The Apostle Paul picked this up. He wrote to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes us strange. It makes the Philippians strange. They stand out in the ways that they behave, in the ways that they work as a community, because their citizenship isn't in Philippi, but in heaven. But that's hard, right? How do you have your eyes on eternity all the time? None of us can. But they don't get it. But they're starting to get worried. So they said to him, who are you? That's basically the critical question of all of Christianity. Who is Jesus? And he says to them, 
just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Like basically he says, why do I talk at all? He's never sounded more fatherly, I think, than in that exact moment. I have heard myself say this to my kids. Why do I even? And I know my dad used to say that to me. Why do I even talk? If you're married, your spouse might tell you this sometimes. You're not even listening to me. When someone you care about says something like, you're not even listening to me, it's time to pay attention. Even if you think you are listening, now's the time to double down and make sure you really are. So what does Jesus say when he has your attention? I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that what I have heard from him. Jesus is ready to give a hard word here. But his authority is not his own. He's not talking like the teacher, the scribe, the Pharisee, the rabbi with wisdom. He's arguing that he has authority and truth and power from the divine himself. In verse 27, we realize they don't get it, and I, I can't blame them. I like to think that I have embarked on an adult lifetime trying to sort out who Jesus is. That's the question of Christianity. And then what does his life and his death and his resurrection mean for me and mean for those around me and in the communities I serve and live in? Sometimes it's infuriating and frustrating because I know I'm looking through a glass darkly and I can see the world. It's hinting at something that I can't quite get. Almost like that sense of deja vu, like there's something just beyond, and you know you're not picking it up. Like if you have an AM radio, and it's like even if it's perfectly dialed, sometimes it's still fuzzy. I can sympathize with these guys who don't know what to do with them. J.I. Packer said, look, this is the biggest thing that ever was, and we Christians, most of us, still haven't appreciated its size. We've been Christians for years and years, and yet we still haven't grasped it. A line like that from an experienced, respected person gives me hope for me, for the story, for you. It's going to take us time. There's also hope tucked into these verses, and you might have missed it if you went too fast, if you skimmed it like most of us would. In verse 24, he said, unless you believe that I am he, then you will die in your sins. You see how much hangs on the word unless? Unless you believe. He goes on, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do things that are pleasing to him. He's not making claims about his own authority, but about God's authority being present among God's people. Now, I'm going to give you the shortest possible version of this, but he's actually using the Old Testament. There's a story about a snake, and when somebody was bit by a poisonous snake in the wilderness, you could bring this other snake, lift it up in front of the person, and the person would be healed. Jesus here is declaring that his dying on the cross, his, his being lifted up, is going to make the healing possible again. He's going to make it possible for everybody to be healed and to follow him where they previously could not follow him. Ironically, Mark, the earliest gospel story we have, and Matthew, claim that how this actually played out is that this centurion, this Roman, this outsider who has no business understanding what's going on, he sees Jesus die, he's lifted up, and when he sees it, he recognizes and he says, truly, this was the Son of God. The outsider sees and recognizes what happened. I wonder about the people in the story, though. Did the threat of being on the wrong path matter to them? Or were they comfortable? Did doctrinal cohesion of the group and obedience 
matter to them or were they open to maybe a new way of doing things? Maybe the tone Jesus used here, his actions mattered to them. Like, why did he get them? How did he get them to say, who are you? All of a sudden they care. Does his promise of healing matter to them? The story ends that many who were present believed that day. Who would believe that day? Like if he came to our church and did this, who would walk out of there with a new form of belief? My guess is to be the people who are most aware that they need healing. Who are most aware that their culture needs healing. Who are most victimized. That they, who know the world needs to have less cheating, less stealing, less abusing, less leaving behind of the marginalized, less people hungry, unhoused, unclothed, all the rest of it. Perhaps the people most desiring change to the status quo would be the ones who hear stories of injustice and who believe in Jesus, who will reconcile it, who will heal it, who will make it right. Maybe some of the people and some of the leaders came to faith that day. We don't quite know. Maybe everybody around could agree that religious activities didn't really earn them anything. It wasn't working. Certainly not the presence of God. Maybe that can lead us to a bit of humility, a bit of care, reverence for how we worship. A little bit of paying attention to where do we make following God a good thing into a rigid religion that God might not like as much. Some of us need to experience forgiveness, mercy, understanding. We need to turn from the path we're on to a different path. Jesus calls us then to lean into him and what he has already done for us. Jesus declares that his actions will be godly, and when they are understood as godly, the person who's done the understanding, if that makes any sense, is now on the right path. The centurion finally recognizing Jesus for who he is, even after he's dead, is now on the right path. Jesus is telling anybody ready to listen to him that there are paths in life, choices you must make, and Jesus will die, he will be lifted up so that your sins are paid for, and you don't have to be lifted up in the same way. Unless you believe who he says he is. The gospel is about being less uptight about what we have to do for God, or believe about God, or what you have to write on your multiple choice exams about God, and more serious about what Jesus has already done for you and what he's doing in you right now. Good works can follow from that. We expect the fruits of the Spirit in the world, compassion for others, who are after all just other sinners who need help. But that help doesn't come from guilt, it comes from freedom from a desire to share a good thing with another person. Like when you read a book and you really want to tell someone else about it, or if you find the perfect croissant or the perfect pizza and you go tell people about it. Sometimes we use words and we say, hey, there's this croissant, you should look at it. Other times we're like, this is so good. I'm going to take you there and I'm going to buy it for you. And I'm going to sit here. And we're going to enjoy it together. Because my actions back up my commitment and my proclamation. When my actions can speak louder than my words, I have to pay attention to how I act. The actions of Christ, as he walked to the cross, died on it. The actions of him, as he unraveled the linens in the tomb, got up and walked out. They're more important than the teachings he left. They're more important than the teachings he offered. Our response to Jesus and the cross matters. That's what Jesus taught. He taught belief in him trumped the rest of it. And the passage says many believed in him. 
Not that they believed what he said. Not they memorized it. But they believed in him. So I'm going to end with a prayer that we would be able to believe too. Would you pray with me? God, we pray that we would believe that the Holy Spirit would be in each of us. That where we are on the right path, Father, you would forgive us and open our eyes, turn us around and send us on the right path. Lord, your Holy Spirit promises fruits that lead to mercy and compassion, winsomeness to others, that they would want what we have in Christ. Father, we pray that Christ would be active in each of us, that our lives would be beacons of his light in the world, that people would look on us and know that we follow him, and that they would like to as well. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We know that. And that's why we ask you to work in us and through us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.